Hello, my name is Jeff, and I'm the lead pastor at Unity Church here in Greenville. Obviously, the vast majority of us are living life a little bit differently than we normally would be. Uh, with some exceptions, people in the health care uh, sector and a few other places, I mean, your life's been disrupted. You're maybe not able to work as much. We're staying home a little bit more. Uh, we've got a little bit more free time. We're, we don't have any sports to watch. Um, we've got a little bit more time to reflect, to think. And I, I've been doing something of that. And I, I've been thinking about my brother. And many of you know that I, I enjoy picking on him. And he is a frequent subject or the brunt of a number of my little uh, jokes at times. And actually, I've, I've been a little bit convicted about that as I've been thinking about it these past few days. And I, I think the Lord would have me to, to stop doing that. And so, Rex, I, I want you to... April Fools! <laughs> I'm not doing any such thing. Um, no, it is a time to reflect. And as I reflect on our church family, man, I miss us being together. I am so ready for us to be back like we used to be, and yet we're probably a month or more before that can even happen. So until then, uh, let's just keep loving on each other, uh, calling each other, keeping in touch with each other. And uh, until we meet again face to face, let's try and strive to be found faithful. So this coming Sunday, my plan is to preach from Psalm 46. I would like to encourage you and your families uh, to read Psalm 46 at least a time or two this week. Uh, reflect on some of those verses. And, and that way you'll be prepared for what I believe the Lord's going to uh, prepare me uh, to preach to you on Sunday via the live stream. This evening, I'd like you to turn to... John chapter 14. It's a familiar passage of Scripture, and we're going to reflect on it in just a few moments. Those of you who are a part of the Unity family, would you please listen through the very end? After I pray, there's a few things I want to say to the Unity family. I chose to put them toward the end instead of up front so that people wouldn't just kind of think that this is not for them and they just keep on trucking. So if you'll keep that in mind, I appreciate it. So a recent headline in the Wall Street Journal reads... Corona, coronavirus creates an epidemic of scams, fake cures, phony charities, fraudulent promises of early stimulus payments, etc. So many people are taking advantage of the fear, the anxiety, and they're lying to people. Uh, in Austin, Texas, a website was peddling non-existent World Health Organization vaccine kits. The website has since been ordered shut down. Earlier in March, the Federal Trade Commission and the Food and Drug Administration issued joint warnings to seven companies selling products that were supposed to treat or prevent COVID-19. One of them, would you believe, was the Jim Baker show? That joker, um, that disgraced Televangelist from yesteryear was actually selling a product called um, Silver, the Silver Solution. It's a scam. People are lying to each other. Anybody in their right mind wants to be told the truth. Everybody in their right mind wants the health organizations, the, the health authorities, the health care authorities, and the governmental authorities to tell us the truth. If you're looking for somebody to manage your financial affairs, don't you want somebody that will tell you the truth? If you're an aspiring high school athlete and you long to be a Division I prospect, don't you want your coach to tell you the truth about how you can improve your skills? If indeed you're moving to a new city and looking to buy a home in a certain neighborhood and you're concerned about the school system, don't you want people to tell you the truth about those respective school systems? Maybe you're in the market for buying a house. Don't you want uh, the real estate agent and the county inspector to tell you the truth about the home? You're of course we do. We all want to be told the truth. Well, if you're wanting to be prepared for death and eternity, don't you want somebody to tell you the truth? Well, I've got good news for you. He who holds the keys to heaven and hell, he has told us the truth about how we can be prepared for death, how we can be prepared for all eternity. 
So if you've been with me these past couple of Wednesdays, we've, we've been in John chapter 14. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus says to his disciples, 11 of them, because Judas has left the scene now, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. The reason he said that, if you'll recall, is Judas, he's going to be a betrayer. Peter, he's going to deny Christ three times, and Christ has reminded his disciples that he will soon be leaving them. And so that trifold um, news has had a very disturbing effect on the collective heart of the disciples. And so Jesus says, men, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, Jesus said, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And then in verse 4, um, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Well, Thomas he asked a question. He's the one who is often the one to initiate the doubting types of comments. He says in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And then Jesus makes that very familiar statement that many of us as believers have long heard most of our lives. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. So, when Jesus says, I am the truth, the truth about what? Specifically, he's talking about the truth about the Father, the truth about those dwelling places, the truth about heaven and how to get there. Kent Hughes, in one of his commentaries, he tells about a fishing contest in which two grand prizes are given. There's a prize for the biggest catch, the biggest fish, and there's also a prize for the biggest lie. He tells of the winning contestant's lie one year. The winner said that he found a fantastic place to fish. In fact, the fish were just watching and waiting for him to drop his line. It was so good that he had to stand behind a tree to bait his hook. Once when he was not paying close enough attention and forgot to stand behind the tree, a seven-pound bass jumped out of the lake, cleared 30 feet of shore, and bit the hook. <laughs> well, do you know how the world views the Bible? As a collection of tales, as a collection of um, folk stories. So let me ask you this question. Is Jesus... This carpenter of Nazareth, is he just inventing a, a fish tale? When he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, is he just uh, coming up with a clever story? Are the Gospels a collection of clever stories, fishermen's tales? No. Well, that would also beg the question, what makes Jesus' truth claims superior to those who are made by other religious leaders, other religious authorities? Well, if, if you want to ask that question, I suggest you go to their graves and ask them. Because see, if you were to go to the graves of any and every other religion, you know what you're going to find? You're going to, found, you're going to find the founder's bones. You're going to find the founder's body decomposed there. You go to Jesus' tomb, you know what you're going to find? empty. Christianity is about 10 days away from celebrating Easter, the fact that Jesus is alive. And so if we're talking about conquering death, if we're talking about eternity and having victory and assurance of where you're going to spend eternity, don't you want to put your faith and trust in somebody who conquered the grave? That's where I want to put my faith and trust. And therefore, I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ the Christ of the Scriptures. So Jesus' resurrection makes his truth claims worthy of your consideration and all other truth claims worthy of rejection. Now, let's go back to Jesus' statement. I am the way and I am the truth. Jesus is not being arrogant. He's just telling the truth. And truth, in and of itself, is always dogmatic. 
Truth is always exclusive. Truth is always intolerant of error and falsehood. Uh, let me give you an example. Two times two is what? Well, it's four. Now, obviously, two times two can only be four. Can you imagine how ridiculous it would be if somebody in another place argued, no, 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 two times two is seven, and in other parts of the world, it's the square root of 27. That'd be ludicrous. There's only one possible answer. Two times two equals four. Well, think about the conflicting truth claims that various religions make, that various bodies of spiritual formation, think about the truth claims they make. Conflicting truth claims cannot all be correct. Mormons, for example, they believe that Jesus is the brother of Satan and a mere angel. Biblical Christianity believes that Jesus is God, the God-man. Both cannot possibly be correct. We support missionaries in India. We believe that people in India need to hear the truth about the gospel because in India, they believe that there are some 300,000 gods. According to biblical Christianity, there is one God manifested in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They can't both be right. Think about the laws of logic. They relate to mathematics, science, history, and yet when it comes to the spiritual world and spiritual matters, it's as though intelligent people just completely check their minds at the door. It's, it's amazing how the laws of logic hold true in mathematics, and yet when it comes to spirituality, you know what? Whatever's right for you, you can believe that, and that makes it right. And if, 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 if you believe something different, well, that makes it right for you. Well, guess what? Somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong. And I, for one, I do not want to stake my eternal future on what could be wrong. So let me ask you this question. Why would sound-minded, and in some cases, highly intelligent people, hold to the laws of logic in certain fields of study, but not do the same with spiritual things? I think I know why. Because the God of this world has blinded their minds lest they come to the truth that Jesus expresses. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The God of this world, that's Satan, he has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. John 8 44. Jesus speaks, the devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So I present to you Jesus. I am the truth. And I present to you Satan. I am the liar. So which one do you want to follow? Believers, Christians follow Jesus. Everybody else, regardless of what they may argue, regardless of what they may say they believe, they're actually following the devil. He's lied to them. And frankly, Satan doesn't care what lie you believe as long as that lie keeps you away from the glorious light and truth of the gospel. So I read about a man who was driving in the country. He passed a barn that had on its side numerous targets. In the center of every single one of those targets um, was an arrow right in the bullseye. He was amazed. He got out of his car and went to congratulate the farmer. The farmer said, I didn't do that. That was done by a young guy in the village who came out and just shot arrows all over the side of my barn, and then he painted bullseyes around each arrow. So many today believe that you can just shoot at whatever you want to shoot at. Boom. You hit the target. Bullseye. 
And folks, it's just not the truth. It's just not the case. Unless you aim your faith at Jesus Christ, I don't care what Satan tells you about having hit some kind of a bullseye. You've, you've, you've cast your faith in the wrong place. Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the way to God. You either choose me or you choose to perish. So let me conclude with three very brief exhortations. Number one, dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him and in him alone. He's the one. He's the way and the only way of salvation. He's told us the absolute truth about heaven and how to get there. I urge you, if you're listening to me and you don't know for sure where you'd spend eternity, if you're not prepared for death, God forbid, but the coronavirus strikes your family. God forbid you contract the coronavirus. And whether you've got other debilitating issues with your health or not, it begins to snuff your life out. Where are you going to spend eternity? Dedicate your life to Christ. Surrender your soul to Him. Put your faith and trust in Him and in Him alone. Repent of your sins because nobody comes to the Father but through Christ. Number two, saturate your mind with biblical truth. So Jesus says, I am the truth. And He, through His Spirit, has given us biblical truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17. Psalm 119.11, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Those of us who do know Christ, saturate your mind with biblical truth. Read it, meditate upon it, memorize it. And then thirdly, demonstrate a Christ-like, compassionate spirit. So we've talked about exclusive truth claims, and we who believe in Biblical Christianity, we believe that Jesus is the only way. However, exclusive claims to the truth does not mean we demonstrate an exclusive spirit. I like what Ravi Zacharias says. He says, without the undergirding of love, the professor of any conviction becomes obnoxious and the doctrine believed becomes repulsive to the one who disagrees with it. The early church also lived in an intensely pluralistic culture in which it had to deliver an exclusive message, but the believers were distinguished and recognized by their love. Our Lord himself proclaimed truth in exclusive terms, terms in which there was no compromise, but he demonstrated that truth by the embodiment of a perfect love. Being possessed of a conviction is a necessary part of following God, but doing so with love and patience are the necessary handmaidens. Would you pray with me? Father, for anybody who may have listened to these previous few minutes of this video recording, who do not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. Father, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would call them to yourself, woo them to yourself. No man can come to the Father unless you draw them, and I pray that you would draw them. Convict them of their sin. Convince them of Jesus being the only way of salvation. Father, for those of us who do know Christ, Lord, help us to continuously feed upon your word, to nourish our souls on good, solid, sound doctrine. Help us, Lord, to be in the word, to meditate upon it, to memorize it, to make it a part of who we are. And Lord, help us who believe in the exclusivity of the gospel to not demonstrate exclusive mean spirits. Help us, Lord, to be like our Savior, convictional but compassionate. And Father, we do continuously cry out to you on behalf of all that's involved in this coronavirus. Lord, for health care workers who feverishly are giving of themselves, who are stepping into harm's way, who are doing all that they can to make life 
as safe for the rest of us as possible, who are ministering to those who are already sick in helping provide care for them. Father, I pray for those uh, who are making crucial decisions, those in governmental leadership, those in the healthcare industry who are advising our governmental leaders. Lord, please give them wisdom about how to to best manage what's going on. In so many places, there's a shortage of supplies. And Lord, I know that certain people, certain companies, certain businesses are stepping up and helping fill in the gap. Lord, would you honor all of those efforts? I know that scientists are working feverishly, trying to come up with a vaccine, trying to come up with better treatments, trying to come up with a cure. Lord, if you would honor those efforts, we would certainly be very, very, very grateful. And Lord, would you be glorified and honored through all of this? And Father, I I selfishly, and yet I think biblically, pray for my church family. Lord, for the people that you've given the pastoral staff and myself the honor to serve and to lead and to help guide in spiritual things. Lord, bless our church while we're apart one from another. Help us to be continuously growing in you so that when we come back together, we might worship you as a corporate body of believers like never before. Father, that's my prayer, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for the Unity family, I I hope you've listened to this point because there's a few things I would like to share with you. Um, I I just want to say how proud I am of our staff. Uh, You guys don't have a clue sometimes all that goes on behind the scenes. But for example, Kevin, I mean, he's keeping the church well-informed, I think, on on prayer updates. And if your email is not in our church system, why don't you call the church office or or send one of the staff an email, and we'll make sure that your email is included. And if so, you'll get these updates when Kevin sends them. He's he's updating the church family on an as-needed basis, not just on maybe a Sunday or a Wednesday. Um, He's also preparing the music for the live stream. He's communicating with the choir and trying to keep them encouraged. And um, he's also the liaison with the trustees and the finance committee and is doing a good job of just keeping all those bases touched. Um, Also, speaking of live stream and speaking about Kevin and music, et cetera, I want to thank those who've been helping out with those rehearsals, the actual recording. Uh, Ty, Beth, Ben, Kristen, Tate, Becky, who helped out this past Sunday, Tim Sutton, Kristen Justice, and, and some others, depending upon the rotation. Hey, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate your willingness to, to, to get out and to help us put together what I, I hope is being received as a, as a quality live stream worship experience. Ben, he's been kind of serving as the executive producer of of all the Sunday live stream services, these Wednesday night Bible studies. As a matter of fact, while you're sitting here listening to me, Ben's right over there. He's got headphones on and when, when I finish doing this, he'll be the one who will do the editing. He's the one who's going to be adding the words over here. He is spending hours upon hours tweaking these things, editing these things. The radio broadcasts that are being um, heard on the radio, a couple of radio stations. He's kind of taking maybe, if I preach 33 minutes, he's got to get it down to 28, 29 minutes, and he, he's doing that as well. Um, Jake and Ty, they're both staying connected with their students and the parents of those students. Uh, Jake's recording devotionals and sending those out. He's encouraging parents to uh, get stay connected with their kids and to have family worship time and, and giving them suggested questions to help facilitate that kind of a thing. Uh, Ty is recording some kids' worship videos. He's doing some fun stuff that the kids are enjoying. Like, for example, he's, he's doing Magic Mondays, and some of you may have saw uh, the, the, video, um, the, uh, yeah, the video clip of a magic trick he did this past uh, Monday. He's posting a lot of stuff on social media. He's, he's really got his hands deep in some of the social media stuff, and I'm very, very appreciative for that. So Elaine's coming into the office periodically. She's kind of coming in and doing some of the uh, must-be-in-the-office-to-do list kind of things. And she's otherwise working from home, uh, calling some of our folks. A number of you maybe have gotten a, a phone call from her, and uh, she's keeping um, the, um, the database updated and uh, answering emails and those kinds of things. Cammie's coming in, doing what needs to be done in the office, putting in the giving and uh, paying the bills and, and making sure those things are taken care of. And, of course, as the church family knows, we are very blessed to have both of those ladies working in our office. There's a lot of other volunteers who are helping out with sound and lights and video 
uh, Tim, Norman, Kerry, Jody, and, and a few others that might help out here and there, but those guys help out just about every single week, and I'm very, very thankful. By the way, one final FYI, for those of you who might have been wondering, our pursuit of a communications coordinator, we have hit the pause button. And I don't know when we'll take the pause off. We're going to have to just wait and see uh, how the year progresses, uh, how things get back to normal, and how the giving runs. But I just want you to know we are not proceeding with that until we feel like we've got the, the financial clarity that we need uh, to move forward. So I love you. As a church family, I love you, and I know the rest of the pastoral staff, we love you. We look forward to being back with you. In the meantime, I'll see you Sunday via the live stream. God bless. Stay healthy, I pray.